Japanese whiskey. If I had a dollar for every time someone asked me about Japanese whiskey, I'd have enough to buy a nice bottle of it by now. And the questions aren't ever about the small differences, it's just a general confusion of how it happened and why it's so big. The second question is much easier to answer. Someone declared a bottle of Japanese whiskey the best whiskey of that year, so now everyone knows it's supposed to be good and that they are supposed to enjoy it. But they still don't know why they should enjoy it, or how Japan came to create such high quality whiskey. That question takes a little longer to answer, but it makes a great story, and it revolves around one man and his unique passion. My name is Ryan Heinzen. I'm a whiskey sommelier and spent three years working in a whiskey bar in Tennessee. There were some bar patrons who came in and threw back a shot, but it was the regulars I was more interested in. Many of them would tell you that I helped teach them about whiskey and even their own taste, but I learned even more valuable lessons from them. These customers have shown me that the experience of a drink is just as important as what's in the glass. Now, some bartenders have an amazing flair for physical feats, tossing and spinning a bottle around, all while creating a fantastic drink and filling their patrons with a sense of wonderment. I can't do that. I've never been the kind of person who seeks the spotlight, but I do like to think I have a flair for storytelling. And as it turns out, most people are bad at remembering the subtle differences in tasting notes between two similar bottles of whiskey, but just like me, they do remember a good story. Behind every bottle is hundreds of stories. Every step starting from growing grain until it reaches your glass, this spirit is collecting experiences and stories that I would love to tell you. It's my goal to sift through these stories, find the most meaningful, and bring them forward to your attention. This isn't another whiskey review channel or show, this is pure storytelling. I won't analyze every detailed tasting note of the spirit in the bottle, instead I'll dive into the details of the spirit behind the bottle. And this is the spirit of Taketsuru. We're going back to 1916. World War I has been ongoing for two years, the toggle light switch has just been invented, Shackleton is amid his journey on the small lifeboat to save his crew, and Masataka Takasuru is 22 years old and at a crossroads in his life. He was born into a family of sake brewers in the Takihara region of Hiroshima and attended Osaka Technical High School to study fermented food production. During his studies, he became fascinated with the western beverage of whiskey. However, with both of his brothers rejecting to take up the family business, Taketsuru's life plan was laid out already for him. He was supposed to take control of the brewery. But he found a different option. In April, he decided that when December came around, he would join the military. This way, he would miss the winter's brewing season, and it would give him a chance at finding a job making whiskey at least once before he resigned himself to the predetermined path his family laid before him. Immediately, there was one roadblock in his plan. At the time, there were no real whiskey distilleries in Japan. There were a few that were making imitations, trying to capture the essence of the foreign spirit, but none that were producing true whiskey. One of the better imitations was from a company by the name of Setsu Shuzo. Luckily, there was an alumni from Osaka Technical working at the company, a man by the name of Kiricho Awa. Awa arranged a meeting for Takatsuru with the company's president, Kahe Abe. At the meeting, Abe was so impressed with Takatsuru's proactive attitude that Takatsuru would walk away from the meeting with a job. He began his new employment in March. His passion and work ethic allowed him to quickly advance in the company to a leadership role in the Western Spirits Division. Here, he will meet a character that will become important to him later on in our story, Shinjiro Tori. Quickly, the months went by, and soon December had arrived. It was time for Takatsuru to join the military. True to his word, he went to a physical evaluation. Since he was a kid, Takatsuru had been practicing judo, so he knew that the physical would pose little difficulty for him. However, during this, 
the first lieutenant conducting the physical, found out that Takatsuru worked to produce alcohol. At this time, Japan was using alcohol in part of the production process for gunpowder, and Japan needed gunpowder more than it needed soldiers. So Takatsuru was deemed second grade. He was not on active duty and could keep his job. Days after narrowly avoiding active military service, Takatsuru's boss Abe called him into his office. He had an opportunity that would change Takatsuru's life. He wanted to have the company pay to send Takatsuru to Scotland to learn how to make true malt whiskey and bring back his knowledge to Japan so they wouldn't be limited to the imitation whiskey any longer. To Takatsuru, this was a dream come true. His parents were considerably less thrilled. His father had still been hopeful that he would be able to pass on the family sake business to his son. But after one visit to the family home by Abe, and it's decided, Takatsuru will go to Scotland. On July 3rd, 1918, in the port of Kobe, Takatsuru boarded the Tenyamaru as a crowd of family and friends gathered to see him off. The ship would take him to America. Specifically, San Francisco. He would eventually make his way to New York via train, but not before making a detour to visit the wine country and learn about the vineyards, where he was unimpressed with how Americans removed the artistry of the craft in favor of the efficiency of the industrial age. Later in life, he would even write, I later visited France and Italy and saw how they would make wine by hand. This was the complete opposite of what I saw in America. To make good alcohol, including whiskey, you can't just scale bigger and expand. Proper maturation requires a patience and the right attitude. My experience at California Winery was helpful in teaching me that at the time. I can't help but think that Americans lack the national character to make good alcohol. From New York, Takatsuru was to cross the Atlantic to England. However, with World War I, the government was a little preoccupied and was slow to grant him the necessary travel visa. The owner of the lodge he was staying at advised him to write to the president, Woodrow Wilson. Not seeing any other course of action, Takatsuru did. And the next day, he would receive his visa. It's unclear if this actually made a difference or if that was pure chance. The journey itself would also prove to be a difficult one, as the ship would travel zigging and zagging across the ocean, desperate to avoid German U-boats. During a dark night while writing a letter to his mother, he was suddenly thrown to the other side of the room. Takatsuru grabbed at his life jacket and raced to the deck, where he discovered the ship was not under attack. Rather, it had collided with another ship, who was also utilizing these maneuvers. Although the ship Takatsuru was on was fine, the other quickly sank, leaving a sole survivor who by some miracle had been thrown off of the sinking ship and onto the deck of the other during the collision. When the ship finally landed in Liverpool, Takatsuru was extremely grateful that this part of his journey had come to an end, and that he was still alive. Now, he needed to decide what to do next. Before he left Japan, he was torn between two different universities, Edinburgh or Glasgow. He first went to Edinburgh, but was dismayed to find that they lacked a substantial science program, so he then elected to travel to Glasgow and attended class there. He was considered to be a foreign auditor of the classes and had studied the subjects back in Japan. However, this time, they were in English. Because he was already familiar with these topics, Takatsuru also had the time to apprentice at a distillery, traveling back and forth via train. That distillery is now known as Longmorn, but at the time was the Longmorn Glenlivet Distillery. At this point, the distillery had only two stills, one for the rougher stripping runs, and one for the more refined spirit runs. 
Takatsuru jumped at every possible experience he could get while working at the distillery. From shoveling barley to cleaning the stills, at the end of the day he would meticulously record everything in a journal. The distillery was known for producing heavily peated malts, resulting in a very smoky whiskey. An important note here is that peat smoke becomes more subtle and nuanced with age. So if a distillery wants a strong smoke presence in a 10 or 15 year old whiskey, the new make is going to be almost unbearably pungent. This process amazed Takatsuru, and he would swear to bring the flavors back with him to Japan. As the year went by, Takatsuru gained an appreciation and understanding of how whiskey was mostly the result of the land, as the water, climate, and every small detail would affect the resulting spirit. And even when keeping everything the same, two barrels sat next to each other may still have different flavors. He wrote that it was so delicately influenced by nature that it felt alive. During the off-season for distilling, Takatsuru would attend his classes as well as travel to Italy and France to study wine making. But it was after class one day that Takatsuru would receive an invitation from a classmate that would again unknowingly change his life. The young woman named Ella had invited him to her family's home for two reasons. The first was that her father, a local doctor, was intrigued by Japanese culture. And the second was so he could teach her younger brother some judo. Well seated with the family for tea, he would meet Ella's older sister, Rita. Soon, Takatsuru would be a regular at their home, and feelings grew between himself and Rita. He would bring her back a bottle of perfume from France, and she returned his gift with a collection of poems from the famous Scottish poet Robert Burns. He would even receive an invitation to join the family for Christmas, joining in on the tradition of Christmas pudding, where a sixpence coin and a thimble are hidden in the pudding. Whoever gets the coin is said to have great wealth in their future. If a woman gets the thimble, it is said she would make a good wife. And if a boy gets the coin and a girl the thimble, they are supposedly destined to marry. So, naturally, Takatsuru got the coin, and Rita, the thimble. Another famous story with the two says that they fell in love while singing Auld Lang Syne together on New Year's, where it is traditional to hold hands in a circle while singing together to bid farewell to the old year at midnight. Takatsuru was living a dream, learning everything he possibly could about the process of making scotch and absorbing the culture of Scotland, using his free time to visit other parts of Europe and focusing on his budding romance with Rita. He had now been away from home for a year and a half, the only Japanese person in the country. He was getting homesick. But even in his dreams where he returned home, his mother would ask him why he had cut the opportunity short. And when Takatsuru got to taste the dissolute that he himself had worked on that had now aged for a year, the feeling of homesick was once again replaced with enthusiasm. The whiskey had taken on a hint of color and was beginning to show glimpses into the deeper character that it could mature into. In May of 1920, Takatsuru received a letter from Rita and her sister, saying that they were going to travel to the highlands where he had been working. Overjoyed, Takatsuru raced to meet them in Glasgow. He wrote, Towards the end of June in Scotland, you began to hear the sounds of bagpipes being played here and there. This is in preparation for summer competitions, where teams of kilt-wearing men march to the sounds of bagpipes. It's similar to Bon Odori in Japan. That trip was fun being surrounded by the sounds of bagpipes and the two women, Rita and Lucy. Going through Inverness, we visited Fort Augustus at Loch Ness, stopped by Arthur's Castle, and headed south. A 
At the end of their journey together, at the shores of Loch Loman, Takatsuru got down on one knee and proposed to Rita. She happily accepted. But the happy couple's luck soon turned, as before they were even married, they would face their first hardship together. Rita's father, who they had counted on being supportive of their intended marriage, passed away suddenly that summer before they could tell him of their plans. With the distilling season starting up again, Takatsuru would be leaving to continue his studies, unsure of where he now stood in the eyes of Rita's family. And that is where we're going to end for now. This isn't the end of the story, though. We'll be picking up where we left off next week. If you want to make sure you don't miss the second half of this story, join my mailing list. The link is in the show description. But for now, I think I'm going to sit back with a nice glass of scotch while I leave you at the edge of your seat. On the next episode of The Spirit Of, we finish our tale, Takesuru and Rita's love, the move back to Japan, a deal with a former co-worker, and what happens when World War II shakes the globe. All this, and of course, whiskey. I'll see you there.